All right, welcome everyone. Um, first off, I just wanted to flag that we do have interpretation for this session. So if you go to the bottom of your screen and click the interpretation button, it's a little globe icon. Um, you'll be able to um, go to channels in English, Spanish, and French. With that being said, um, good morning, afternoon, evening. Um, welcome to the Youth Morning Briefing. This is one of three civil society briefings happening during the CSW. I can put the link in the chat for the next one that's happening next week. Um, my name is Devin Zingler. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals, along with Safira, who you'll meet later. Uh, during this session, we'll hear from youth on their suggestions and perspectives on the CSW priority theme, which I'm sure we all know by now is climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction, as well as the agreed conclusions document. Uh, for the last several months, global youth have been studying the priority theme and putting together a recommendations document. These recommendations have been shared with member states to be considered for the final CSW 66 outcome document. In a few minutes, we'll hear from some young people on their experience with developing these recommendations and their advocacy with member states. We're super grateful for all of their hard work and passion that went into this process, especially with the theme of climate change and gender equality being so pertinent to young people's experiences around the world. Um, with that being said, I will now pass it over to Rosalind Helfand, the thematic lead for the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition. Thank you so much, Devin. Hello, it is such an honor to be here with you. Uh, we at the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Coalition are so grateful for youth leadership leading up to and at CSW 66 and your commitment to climate justice and gender equality. Thank you for that. Um, at the Feminist Action Coalition for Climate Justice, youth serve as action coalition leaders. They are represented in our commitment makers and our coalition is committed to continuing to engage, advocate with and include youth in our decision-making processes. And I want to take a quick moment um, to share for those of you who are unfamiliar with our coalition, what our, our vision says, and this is an excerpt. By 2026, the Coalition on Feminist Action for Climate Justice will have initiated a transition to an inclusive and regenerative green economy that recognizes the interconnectedness of climate change with issues of gender justice and protects and amplifies the voices of grassroots and indigenous communities including frontline defenders across social and political arenas. Women and girls in their full diversity, equitably and meaningfully participate in decision-making processes at all levels, including in aligning key climate policy instruments with national development plans and developing climate responses that center human rights. Meaningfully participate in decision-making processes at all levels. This is what you're here at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women's Negotiations to do. And with your voices, youth voices, we will succeed. I've always believed this, but Youth Action Coalition leaders, Ani Aloise and Aishka Najib of Fridays for Future MAPA made it abundantly clear when they presented the global youth recommendations at an event we hosted by our coalition on Wednesday. When I asked how they would like to present their point, they said collectively, because this movement is not about just one person. And that's just what they did, presenting on the recommendations in concert. This drive to be bold, to innovate, but so importantly, to work collectively and inclusively is what makes youth leadership on climate change and putting gender equality at the center of solutions so powerful. Another incredible example of this drive is the ambition of your recommendations process. More than 25 community level youth led consultations across six regions informed your recommendations. That is no small feat, but the work you did to connect in a way that is so meaningful and representative lends enormous weight to the recommendations 
as you share them at CSW 66. Your voice and the messages you have developed are essential. And as we move forward into our second week, I encourage you to keep engaging with persistence with the CSW delegates, with nations, to ensure that you are heard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name is Safira. I'm with Devin, one of the co-chairs of the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals Program um, of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women. Um, and I'd now like to introduce Mariella Di Carvalho, um, representing the permanent mission of Germany to the United Nations. Um, and also to honor the, the youth observers that Germany has in New York City for the commission this year, Leonie and Carlotta. But we'd like to invite you, Mariella, to share some of your thoughts about how youth issues are being integrated into the commission this year, how they relate to the priority theme and the outcome document negotiations. So we'd love to just hear your thoughts on how things are going so far. So the floor is yours, Mariella. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. It is great meeting all of you, uh, seeing some of you today. Um, I think I saw some of you at the Vienna Cafe this week or maybe last week as well. Um, so yeah, uh, Germany is um, the facilitator of the Agreed Conclusions this year. So it's my ambassador um, who is doing the facilitation. We were just uh, negotiating yesterday and we will continue today. Um, and we, we always look forward to, to receiving input from civil society and especially from, from the youth representatives. So thank you so much for, for all the work uh, you have done um, in drafting recommendations, um, reaching out to us, um, meeting with us, um, and also reaching out to, to the member states um, because we are the facilitator this year. This means that we're not bringing in our own position to the negotiations, um, but instead, you know, my ambassador is, is being more neutral um, and taking in all the input from the other member states. Um, that's why I would also encourage you to reach out um, to the member states that are negotiating. They always um, cluster in groups. Um, so for example, there's the, the mountains group, um, with um, New Zealand and Canada, for example, I, I believe they would be very open to, to receiving your input as well, um, or the Santiago group with the Latin American countries. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind that there are um, many member states that are open to, to receiving your input. Um, and yeah, um, as we just mentioned, we have um, two youth observers yeah, two youth observers um, with us um, in New York this week. They are part of the German delegation to CSW. Um, they also um, provided their input and their recommendation on the conclusions. Um, so that's really great. And uh, they are very involved um, here in New York this week. Um, we had several side events where they participated. Um, they went uh, to uh, to the general debate, um, to the roundtable discussions, um, and it's great to have to have them here with us and to have another input day here on the call. But uh, I heard they are busy; they have another meeting soon, so they must uh, leave um, soon. But um, I, I believe that you are in contact. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a great way to to have youth input directly in the missions in the UN. Um, I know there, there have been some difficulties still uh, because of COVID, uh, some travel restrictions, um, and um, also the UN building just opened for civil society this week. Um, but I believe that some civil society representatives were now able to enter the building and then to exchange uh, with the delegates in the UN um, and provide their input there, um, which is really great. And I hope that next year the COVID situation um, got better um, and um, that there, it will be even more uh, lively and um, more exchange happening in person um, at the UN. 
So yeah, um, if you have any more input, um, any questions about the process, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, and we are so impressed by all the work you do around the world and how, how you got together, exchanged uh, your views. It is truly impressive. And so thank you so much for all these efforts. Thank you so much, Mariella. And it's so wonderful you were able to join us today amongst all of the other things that you've got going on on the part of your mission. So thank you to you and to, to the German mission for, for being with us today. Of course, it's great being here. Wonderful. So we're going to move to now hear from some of our youth speakers. And we have intentionally invited young people from different regions of the world so that we get a, a good sense of um, the global conversation. Um, and we're inviting each of these young people to speak a little bit about their climate um, advocacy, their work, um, to share, introduce themselves a little bit, um, but also to be respectful so that of, of time so that we have a chance to hear from everybody equally. Um, so to start us off, I would like to invite Aishka, who will who'll be representing on behalf of the MENA region. She is a youth climate justice activist based in the UAE. She works with Fridays for Future on most effective people in areas, Fridays for Future Digital and Pass the Mic Climate. So Ashka, if you can tell us a little bit about the youth recommendations, what are the key asks, the key lessons and, and takeaways to share at this point? Um, thank you so much, Safira, for the questions and the space. Uh, so honestly, this whole process was um, very insightful. Um, and I think as Rosalind mentioned, the way that we uh, reached to these recommendations was by conducting um, you know, regional consultations. We had over 25 community level consultations, which engaged with over like 1,000 500 youth from across six different regions. Um, and these consultations were highly diverse and showed us the importance of taking a bottom up approach and building from the demands of those at the grassroots level to facilitate a strong movement for change. And since um, we took such an approach in building up our recommendations, our recommendations clearly focuses uh, the frontline communities and the frontline voices and takes an intersectional approach uh, in figuring out how we can collectively take actions and collectively um, figure out how to, um, you know, solve these issues, because we need to recognize that the climate crisis did develop in an unequal world and it will intensify the uh, it will intensify uh, the vulnerabilities of the people whose lives are shaped by these systemic inequalities, right? So some of the key points or key asks of our recommendation is to see that the climate crisis is an issue of now, uh, to understand that there is loss and damages happening, so to pay for reparations, um, to resource climate finances, and as well as acknowledge the historic responsibility of those nations uh, that have, you know, com contributed uh, disproportionately, um, and the need to take actions to cut emissions. Um, so those are some of the key asks that highlight the most affected people in areas' voices. And I think uh, something that stood out to me in this collaboration was how all of us came from different backgrounds with different skills and to work together to find the balance uh, and make sure that the actions streamline, um, you know, gender transformative as well as uh, the climate justice, uh, from climate justice focus of lens as well to push for a global youth recommendations. And now I hope that as we move forward, we have uh, key stakeholders and other, you know, important <laughs> um, sub people who are there to provide us with their continued support to amplify the global youth recommendations and make sure that they are integrated in the agreed conclusions. That's really wonderful. And thank you so much for describing the process that, you know, really this 
strong movement at the grassroots and then having that kind of reflected in the recommendations, I think is really powerful. So thank you to you and your team for coordinating that and drawing on the diverse skill sets and perspectives that young people offer. So I'm going to move us now to hear from Esther. Esther is um, coming at us from the African region. She is an energy business mentor, where she is supporting over 150 women to develop businesses in the clean cooking and off-grid solar value chains. So Esther, tell us a little bit about what role young people in Africa play. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and uh, for the invitation to be part of this event. Uh, as you said, my name is Esther. I'm from Kenya. I'm a young renewable energy enthusiast and a strong adv advocate for SDG 7, and also gender inclusion in uh, SDG 7. So my work has mainly been working with women uh, in communities, in grassroots here in Kenya, uh, where we support them uh, with business development services to ensure that uh, they develop their business in the clean cooking, uh, in off-grid solar value chains. Uh, I've worked with over 150 women here in Kenya and uh, supported them with mentorship support, access to finance, uh, to ensure that their businesses are uh, stable and sustainable. So uh, the other work I've been involved in is uh, under SDG7 Youth Constituency, which is under the United Nations major group of children, children and youth. We've been involved in advocacy activities to ensure youth inclusion in decision making and uh, uh, meaningful youth engagement uh, around energy matters and everything that is uh, uh, geared towards achievement of uh, SDG7. So in terms of uh, uh, the role of youth, we, how can youth uh, be involved in uh, accelerating access to SDG7 or achievement of uh, SDG, SDG7? We have young people who have great ideas, which they can implement in terms of businesses, in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, how we can change these innovations into ideas or into something which can benefit the community. And I believe these are a key area when we come together as young people uh, to ensure that our ideas are put out there, are implemented, they can go an, a long way in ensuring achievement of SDG 7. Uh, we have forums, like I just stated, the SDG 7 Youth Constituency, where we advocate for inclusion of youth in decision-making processes. Uh, it's high time many youths from uh, around the globe join us to ensure that we have one voice while uh, we advocate, you know, we are going to these uh, member states and other decision makers. Uh, we work together, we are organized so that our voices are heard. Uh, there is a, this, thing we say uh, that there is power in youth and when we work together there'll be a great impact in ensuring that whatever uh, we want uh, we want uh, from we want the decision makers uh, to enact is really uh, enacted so the other bit is uh, ensuring that uh, we get involved you know these activities uh, we have now the recommendations, which uh, we've gathered from many voices. It's our responsibility to ensure that these re uh, recommendations are out there, everyone knows about them, and uh, that they are enacted. So that's uh, what I'm going to speak. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. That's wonderful, Esther. Thank you so much for sharing, particularly your work around SDG 7. Um, which is affordable and clean energy. That's the, the goal. Um, and just to hear a little bit from you about young people's ideas, translating those ideas into innovation, into business that benefits the community, um, the role that entrepreneurship plays, which then allows youth to be um, incorporated in these decision-making processes. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I'll turn us now to Ishan, who is um, representing Europe. Um, and we have um, Ishan's work is around international anti-human trafficking. 
gender equality and climate justice. He is the founder of Stolen Dreams, which is a youth-led organization combating contemporary forms of slavery and trafficking in persons. So Ishan, tell us a little bit about your experience connecting with different governments in regards to the youth recommendations um, to ensure that they're considered in the agreed conclusion. Over to you. Sure, thank you so much, Safira. As, as Aishka alluded to, the youth recommendations that we have are really this incredibly strong and powerful set of concrete language suggestions that we have been pushing member states to integrate into the agreed conclusions as the text is negotiated. And we've actually had the opportunity to interact and engage with member states directly to inform them of our positions as youth and propose edits to the language of the draft outcome text. And it has truly been an insightful experience to see how negotiations work, to see how member states interact with each other. And these past weeks have certainly highlighted the importance of language, terminology, but also political context as well. And negotiations are still ongoing, so the text is inevitably going to change and adapt in the coming days before the second reading, but the text does need strengthening. And what we're seeing is that, for example, the language around girls should be strengthened throughout the text. We are noticing the limitations of language around migration, inclusivity, human rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights. And we would really like to see language around ensuring accessible funding for youth and girl-led organizations. And more broadly, we are continuing to push for language around youth. So we recently actually heard that language around the youth forum is being negotiated in the methods of work and the agreed conclusion sessions. So we continue to urge member states to support this. And we are really grateful for the positive and encouraging engagement that we've had in member states, um, you know, at the virtual Vienna Cafe over email, but also in other advocacy spaces, you know, with the delegations of Germany, Poland, Costa Rica, Ireland, the Netherlands, UK, and several other, other member states who have been very supportive of, of our youth voices. And each time we have submitted our markups and inputs, which has been around three or four times now, I believe, we can see that some of our suggestions are slowly being integrated into the outcome document, which is incredible, um, the influence that we're having. But overall, what we've learned is that it's important to be diplomatic and strategic, but it's equally as important to harness our power as youth and to be bold, to persevere and keep pushing for our voices to be heard at the negotiating, negotiating table to influence the agreed conclusions. And there is still one more week to go, so we will continue to push and of course, this is by no means the end. We will continue to carry our youth recommendations through to COP27 and beyond. But we're very excited for the final week of CSW to see how our youth recommendations, our inputs are being integrated into the agreed conclusion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ishan. To you and your team, it is a lot of fine work kind of going through the language, going through the terminology, but it's wonderful that the response from member states has been positive and language is being integrated and in both the methods of work and the agreed conclusions of this commission. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing to be bold and to have that language reflected. I'll now turn us over to Alma, um, who is a national gender youth activist for UN Women, who was a co-organizer for the CSW 65 Youth Forum. Alma, tell us a little bit about your experience in attending the Vienna cafes. What has worked there? What could have what could have been done better? Um, but just share a little bit about your experience there with us. Yes, thank you very much. So happy to be here. So um, if you are still a little bit confused on what's the Vienna Cafe, worry not because we were in your same position up until a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, I think even if you search on Google, if I can recall correctly, there's not detailed information there. So it's just a very interesting intergenerational dialogue space, one in which in and out of metaphor tables are shift because you really get to engage directly with the delegations that are present there and um, together with civil society, really work on translating the language that comes from the grassroots level into one that can fit the agreed conclusion. And you can have a chance to directly ask, as we have been doing so far, about including youth and girls language, of course, flexible funding and accessible funding for youth. But we also went into top key um, issues that as youth we do advocate for, like the key importance of uh, women farmers in preserving biodiversity or comprehensive sexuality education as a key solution to the climate crisis. So 
there might be also another general confusion out there. That's at least my experience because as youth, we're not just our age. We're not the, let's say like the registry office delegation. We are a diverse group. Uh, we don't come from the same organization, so uh, we're not interchangeable. And so, you know, we don't want to be boxed just in the paragraph that speaks about youth as much as women don't uh, accept to be boxed in the paragraph about gender only. So we really trying to push and advocate for key recommendations that uh, we feel that are important. And as you've heard from Aishka and Ishan we, and Esther, we touch upon almost all the, uh, if not all the uh, key themes of the, this year's CSW. And um, in the spirit of intergenerational feminist leadership, uh, I think it's really important um, that uh, since um, nothing about us without us is definitely accepted within the feminist civil society, that this is comes the same, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel of the time of the time, uh, but uh, that we can really support one another. And um, I really encourage uh, NGO CSW to keep. Uh, opening spaces for youth. It's truly a, a learning uh, experience for us. And we have our full support for next year for a, a youth Vienna Cafe. So one in which uh, we can continue opening more spaces and uh, amplify feminist youth voices together with the youth delegates of member states. Thank you so much, Alma. It's really wonderful to hear that it's been a, a positive experience, but also it's it's so exciting to hear next year to have a Youth Vienna Cafe to continue opening those spaces. So that's exciting and something definitely to organize and look forward to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I'll hand over now to Ani. She is a long-term member of NGO CSW's Youth Leaders and Young Professionals, um, and this year coordinated the youth survey for the NGO CSW Advocacy and Research Committee. Um, so Ani, tell us a little bit about the process of the youth survey that was undertaken this year, and what impact do you hope that survey will have? Yeah, thank you, Safira. And I just have to say, it's so amazing to be here and hear um, the amazing work about the amazing work that's being done. I'm really impressed. Um, so just to give a little bit of context on what the youth group did. So we're part of the NGO system research and advocacy group. We're leading the youth research. Um, and as part of that research, we didn't want to do only secondary research. So we launched a survey and it was in English and Spanish. Uh, and we reached um, 28 countries and got 48 responses. Um, and we incorporated the responses into our um, into our research and the way um, research was structured. So, um, and our um, people on the call would know, uh, might know that CS and CSW has created six recommendations. Um, they're, they're called zero draft recommendations, and we took each of them and a couple to mention a couple. You know, investment in gender responsive policies and prioritization of knowledge management, um, collection of comprehensive data on displaced girls and women, and so on. So we took those recommendations and researched how young women and girls are affected um, um, it, on, that, on those specific topics. And um, just want to say that unfortunately, but not surprisingly, um, um, it doesn't look very helpful. Um, so we know that youth constitute the majority of the population in many countries and young women and girls are uniquely uh, and are fortunately disproportionately adversely affected by the climate disaster. Um, and we found that um, climate crisis um, you know, intensifies the pre-existing developmental gaps and young women and girls are uh, specifically uniquely affected. And we also found a really interesting research by Plan International and UNICEF that looked into 160 uh, national policies and found that young women are, and girls are not included in most when it comes to creating and including girls um, in education um, policies. So we're already fighting to have gender responsive policies when it comes to creating climate um, 
policies and disaster risk reduction uh, processes. And um, in that fight, women and young women and girls are uh, not covered, not included at all. So we, with this research and survey and getting all the amazing responses from, um, from 28 countries, we understood that we just want to highlight um, uh, a language that can be incorporated um, to, to make sure that young women and girl, girls are not excluded. And we heard a lot of points that, you know, we don't want to box young women and girls into a paragraph. Uh, but this specific survey and research just wants to highlight the needs um, that this population has. So we hope with the survey to, you know, this has been published and this has been circulated with all the delegations. So we hope that it, it um, brings attention to the specific and unique needs that young women and girls have. And I haven't had a chance to attend Vienna Cafe, but I hope, I hope I'll be able and I'll have the opportunity soon. So hoping to advocate and, and um, push some of the language and, and showcase some of the research and, and survey results that we were able to um, together. Hope that was helpful. Yeah, that was great, Ani, thank you. And thank you to you and your team for the work that you've put in to really research deeply, understand the current situation, really look at the national gender, um, responsive climate and disaster policies, and, and just the work that has been done to share that information with civil society so that all of us going into the commission had the, the most up-to-date data and information on, on the unique and specific needs of young women and girls. Um, so thank you so much. So I, I want to encourage um, some questions in the chat. Um, thank, you, thank you all to our youth speakers who've really shared the wonderful work that has been going on during the commission and, and in the lead up to it. So if you have any questions on what you've just heard, please feel welcome to put in the chat. Um, I did want to highlight one, which I saw in the chat, which was around how young people can continue mobilizing. And we heard from Ishan and a, a few of our speakers that this is really a process in the lead up to COP27, which many of you know will be held in Egypt um, in November this year. So it feels like a lot of the organizing um, and this kind of advocacy process will move us beyond the CSW towards COP27. Um, so this question around how youth can continue mobilizing, what opportunities will exist beyond the CSW? Um, what can we do? in our own kind of spheres of influence, whether it's at the grassroots, at the national level, or continuing on at the international level. Um, so I would like to invite any of our speakers, if you have thoughts on continued mobilization, um, to please offer some thoughts. But perhaps I can turn to Jivika, um, who's been very, very involved in this space. If you have any thoughts just to get the ball rolling about how young people can continue mobilizing at this point or anything that you're able to share. Well, thank you, Safira. I think it's critical to go back at this point and go back to our networks. It's something I did in the morning today with the markups from those sent to the youth, back to the India consultation participants, at least speakers and uh, within the women farmers and the young women farmers movement that I come from. And I think it's important for them to know what's going on, to continue to mobilize, for example, the language on girls is diluted, the language on loss and damage is diluted. We're still negotiating place for youth as even observers, right? So to even talk about that or to talk about the language of women farmers or this invisibilization of unpaid work, it becomes important to go back to those that impacts the most. And I think this holding those consultations right now, online, offline, um, seeing where they can go and put pressure on their own governments is the immediate need. But I think this document and I think any other negotiations, whether it was COP, whether it's CSW is also to be used to build the narrative around climate justice, right? Especially especially if you come from the global north, it's time to look at what the global south is saying. There's a disproportionate uh, accountability that you have in the global north to take it back. And I think that's something that came out from a lot of young feminist consultations as well. So perhaps just taking it out, simplifying it in your own languages, because we've been speaking about language justice as the core of perhaps uh, engaging with international processes and at the core of climate justice as well. So taking it back there and also making sure that we're engaging with governments at the level of local groups, right? Just um, some of the authors and other 
contributors to the recommendations going to about 20 governments from their own community networks beyond this global youth sitting here in privileged places has made such an impact to how they are hearing us. And I think we need to continue to do that and learn from member states who are doing it more actively and perhaps listening to civil society and definitely engage more with governments like mine which are still to understand how to engage with youth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jivika. That's really, really helpful to hear. And also just to um, highlight some of the, the links that have been shared in the chat. Um, many of you have seen the CSW 66 Global Youth Recommendations on Youth, Gender and Climate Change has been linked in multiple languages. We also have the advocacy and research groups recommendations and briefs that have been linked. Um, so please look at those resources and, and see how we can continue mobilizing beyond the CSW. I did want to turn back to our speakers if anyone wanted to add anything um, about how to engage during the CSW or beyond, um, if there's anything you'd like to share about continued youth mobilizing at this point. Yes, so on my side, this is Esther. Yeah, for those who are interested to join SDG7 Youth Constituency, I'll leave my email in the chat. You can reach out to me and I'll let you know how to join us. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Esther. Please do use the chat to connect with one another. We, we have many outstanding young activists on the call. So feel welcome to add your LinkedIn, your email address, and it would be wonderful to also use this space to connect and see how we can move forward together. I see Alma has a hand raised. Go ahead, Alma. Yeah, so uh, as we were saying, do connect with us. Uh, like from my side as NGYA, we are lucky to be almost everywhere because we're like a group of 300. So do find one and connect. And also uh, join us uh, with the Young Feminist Manifesto. It was dropped in the chat. It's a very great tool for navigating spaces as youth. And um, really take and grab the space that you find, honestly. It's the same from the experience at the Vienna Cafe. You, we really need to learn how to uh, you know, speak up about our issues in a very key and concise way. Um, and I also think it's important to address at all level of decision making. So perhaps start, you know, with your local representatives and present these documents and discuss the outcomes and and build from that all the way. Or perhaps if you're part of other groups, you know, and this is such an intersectional issue for this year. So I'm sure you can take it and make it yours in any space for your activism and advocacy. Fantastic. Alma, thank you so much for sharing that and for highlighting that resource. I'll hand to Aishka. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to say that um, as we move beyond, especially coming from more of a climate justice uh, focused lens, uh, we want everybody to join the climate there isn't you know a specific person there is like there's no perfect activist you don't have to uh, know a certain thing or like do a certain thing to be a part of the climate movement uh and join now join your local movement join us at fridays for future or any other climate movement and some exciting is going to organize March 25th. Uh, so if you go to the Fridays for Future website, you can see which all strikes are near you. Uh, if you can't attend an uh, in-person strike, you can attend the strike digitally online. Uh, so do check that out. Do check out Fridays for Future on Twitter and Instagram to know more about the strike, a narrative and things like that. And we would love to see you all there. Would love to engage and build the movement together. Thank you so much, Aishka. I also see a hand. Gebetagon, would you like to share how young people can get involved? If you're able to unmute and share. Okay, maybe, maybe while that's being figured out, I wanted to highlight a few things that are coming through in the chat. Um, so there is a question, how do you recommend to best follow up on the current negotiations on outcomes and agreed conclusions for those who are attending virtually? Um, and is the latest draft of the agreed conclusions publicly available? 
So that's a question perhaps for some of those who've been more closely involved with the negotiations, if you are able to speak to that. Um, there is also a suggestion in the chat about um, perhaps dedicating a session or a future side event for sharing action taking. So perhaps having kind of a regular space where we can come together between now and COP. Um, and I imagine UN Women will be on top of this, but I also know that NGOCSW's youth leaders and young professionals are always happy to provide a platform um, for conversations like this, for sharing and networking to take place so that we can mobilize yeah. together. I see that there is an invitation to join Fridays for Future um, in the chat. And then also um, a recommendation for academia um, to write about youth and climate linkages and to share that in our spaces. So if anyone does have access um, to academia, please do share so that we can draw on data and ac academic sources to back up our advocacy. So yes, we can hear you if you'd like to go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, the point I would like just to make is that there, I mean, the concern of climate change should be considered as a, I mean, a very important issue that has to be handled at the local level and national, and why not a, at the international level? And I think all the young people should try to set up maybe a kind of strategy so as to create, to I mean, to take initiatives and help their young people to create movements or anything that can help them to, to address the environmental issues and climate change challenges every day. And as, when we, we, let, we, we let down local level, I think we all, maybe we have just to create association or maybe group led of your flag organization so as to discuss the topics or the main issue that can be uh, maybe considered as a priority in our day-to-day -day life. And I think that we all have to join hands and do whatever it takes to overcome the challenge of climate change. So that's the point I'll just like to make. Thank you so much for offering that. I see a few other hands, so maybe we can take Jivika, um, Akwayemi, and then Ishan, and then we'll have to wrap up for today. So over to you, Jivika. I was just saying that all of you who want to join in the climate justice um, work, join in the climate justice action collision uh, work as a commitment maker, bring in your work into the space, say, you know, join in the larger targets to be able to work on gender, youth, and climate change. Commitments are still open and you can also contact Aishka. She's one of the Action Coalition youth leads on climate change from Fridays for Future. Or you could write to the Action Coalition Secretariat directly. But it'll be great so that you also keep in touch, uh, inform the agenda on gender and climate change. Because while we move ahead, we must also look at the intersections um, of being youth, working on climate change and on gender. And I think all three are important intersections and many more if you come from different marginalizations or identities or vulnerabilities. So just please sign in. We'll put it. We'll put it in the chat as well for you to become commitment makers. Take your time, and if you need help, you can contact any of the NGYs as well from your country or other. Perfect. Thank you, Jivika. That link to become a commitment maker will be fantastic. So please put that in the chat. Um, over to you, Akoyemi. Hello, um, so my name is Claude and my pronouns he, him. Over here in the UK, we're currently having our human rights of protest uh, at risk at the moment by the policing bill and also right to protest online or even in person. More than ever, it's more important that we support these recommendations of this CW6, CW26, because um, it's so important that we also make our voice be heard, especially when it comes to any topics of gender equality. And as an activist for reducing inequality and quality of education, it is more than ever that our voice is kind of being muted. 
So I just wanted to share to other activists that, you know, take your action now, share these recommendations, and do also spread the word about the importance of your right to protest and your right to make your voice be part of decision making and the table of decision making. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claude. Thank you for that reminder. I'll hand over to Ishan, if you can share anything about the outcome document process and the question that was shared earlier. Of course, yes. Yeah. So the facilitator um, often publishes uh, the, the, the vision of the conclusions. Um, so we have access to that. And, and actually we spent most of Tuesday and yesterday, you know, over 12 hours, a group of us young people sitting there going through the text line by line, integrating our youth recommendations um, and seeing where we can influence the text and where the language is most appropriate. Um, so we do have that document um, and if anybody would like access to a copy of it, uh, the youth recommendation side of things um, and the markup, then feel free to get in touch. We're more than welcome to share it and you're more than welcome to use it in your advocacy um, at CSW next week um, and beyond as well. Thank you, Ishan. Yes, it, it would be so helpful for all of us to be following um, the document and the markups and, and the changes that are taking place over the next, next week or so. So thank you all for your contributions to our youth speakers, to those who've posed questions in the chat. Um, I would now like to hand over to Maris Berberg, um, who is with the permanent mission of Latvia to the United Nations, um, to share with us the state of play around the agreed conclusions. He has so kindly given us five minutes of his time um, to share this update with us. So thank you so much, Maris, for being with us. And the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Maris from the Mission of Latvia and a member of the Bureau of the CSW that organizes the whole session this year and also for the next year. Uh, the responsibilities this year are divided um, between uh, Latvia and Germany regarding the documents that we have to produce and uh, Germany is facilitating methods of work. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the agreed conclusions and I'm facilitating the methods of work. Uh, so I would like to talk a bit about methods of work because it also concerns the participation of youth in the whole work of the Commission. At the moment, the Commission operates on the basis of methods of work that were adopted in 2015. If you would look at the document that you, you would see that there are mentioning in several paragraphs of participation of civil society in the work of the Commission. There are involvements, uh, consultations for civil society, to decide on, on, on different um, aspects of how the session is organized and, and the documents produced. But nowhere in the document youth is uh, mentioned explicitly. The methods of work is a document that has um, very precise paragraphs that talk about who can do what in the commission and there are also more general paragraphs that are encouragements for the Commission uh, to organize things in certain uh, manner. And um, we have been mandated this year to review these methods of work. And I am facilitating the talks, the negotiations among the countries, how we could improve the methods of work. And I guess you are most interested in uh, the aspects that concern the participation of youth, whether there are new elements envisaged that would um, improve your access to the, uh, to the session of the Commission. And I have good news for you. Indeed, um, in the general paragraphs, if I look at the text that we are still working on, it's not finalized yet, but there are paragraphs that countries were able to agree upon. And in a few of them, 
that talk about participation of civil society, there will be no mentioning of youth explicitly. For example, there will be uh, a new paragraph that um, that calls upon the Commission to uh, ensure participation of relevant stakeholders, and then the stakeholders are named very briefly, and it says that it's including non-governmental organizations, civil society, and youth. There will be a paragraph, a paragraph about the um, about delegations to the Commission. It will um, encourage the member states to consider including in the commission uh, in the delegation to this uh, commission sessions te technical experts and uh, budgeting experts statisticians but also it will say that civil society actors including youth uh, should uh, should be included. Well, it's an encouragement. So it's one of the general uh, paragraphs and this encouragement for uh, member states, how they compose their delegations when they come to New York uh, will include encouragement to include youth. And I was chairing a meeting, the general discussion um, uh, two days ago. And I was so happy to see that indeed, uh, at least in the time that I chaired, there was one delegation that um, presented their national statement and the statement um, was read in the beginning by the minister of the country, but it was concluded by the youth delegate. That's... Uh, we are also uh, this year cons uh, making a document how to how to celebrate the 30th anniversary anniversary of the fourth world conference of women that will be the celebration will be in uh, 2025 so we are already setting some organizational parameters uh, how how the how the year should look like for the CSW and also there there will be uh, a strong encouragement to collaborate with stakeholders including youth at all levels in the preparation for the 2025. That's about general encouragements but one of the most important things is a very concrete change that is suggested in the methods of work and it is that there should be a new event in the official program of the commission and this, this event would be an interaction between youth and the representatives of the countries the officials this um, is the only outstanding paragraph that we have not agreed so far. We were supposed to finish our negotiations on the methods of work already last week, but you have friends in government and uh, there are governments that very strongly stand uh, by your side and really want this to happen, to have a new segment in the Commission's official work where we, we would engage uh, with the youth. So we are still in negotiations and we do not uh, uh, shut it short, cut it short. I as a facilitator, I did, I did not um, go the easy way meaning that when i see that there is no agreement possible among the countries and that the negotiations go on for hours and we cannot reach an agreement 
one of the possible ways is to cut to the negotiations and um, and just not adopt the the idea meaning that we just exclude the youth dialogue uh, the paragraph that uh, would establish the youth uh, dialogue from the methods of work but we were not willing to do that because um, it is seen by many member states as an important improvement so they were willing to fight and uh, not give in on that idea so we continue to work on it it looks like that we might have an agreement uh, possibly even this week and it 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 looks like it might be positive that there will be this very concrete improvement in the methods of work that will concern the participation of youth and that uh, there will be a new segment fingers crossed we'll see the nothing is um, is certain and uh, negotiations go can go any di direction but from my perspective how i see it i see that uh, countries are starting to agree and it's uh, going into direction of of having the new segment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maris. That is so exciting. You're getting lots of support in the chat. <laughs> so we're hopeful. Let's see how this all unfolds. But really, thank you so much for all of the work that you and your team are putting in this week and, of course, continuing to next week. And thank you for making the time to join us and give us these updates. So much appreciated. So I'm going to move us to hear a little bit from Oidrilla. Um, we didn't get a chance to hear from her earlier on, but I'm glad that she's here. So um, Oidrilla is a climate activist and intersectional feminist. She, had led, she has led projects like planting over 100,000 trees across India and has designed a campaign with UNICEF where she advocated for climate justice through poetry. So wanted to hear a little bit about um, the role of adolescent girls in climate discussions and what can be done to ensure their visibility in this commission. So over Thank to you. you. Go ahead. So, Masif Paira. Um, so, the role of adolescent girls in climate discussion definitely needs to be leading the discussions affecting them in these spaces uh, instead of others taking decisions on behalf of them. Because generally, what we have seen is that for adolescent girls, it's always the elder youth or adults who are basically taking decisions on behalf of us. And adolescence is that period when uh, gender roles are more defined. Hence, girls are confined to their houses, limiting their participation in public spaces. It is often also assumed that climate change only affects a person when they are stepping outside the house. But it is not true. Climate change can increase poverty, and it does, according to reports. And this means that girls are fed less, have to bear the burden of household work, uh, less likely have access to health care, and also less likely to go to school or rather drop out. They are also more likely to face sexual assaults and also be victims of marriage due to climate change. And this concept is popularly known as climate rights in South Asia. Uh, also, uh, when adolescent girls and young people are demanding for their rights, either their voices are ignored and in some of the cases, the authorities also arrest them. Adolescent girls are treated as liability in most societies and their participation in discussions to make decisions for themselves is not encouraged, nor enough steps are being taken to do so. Um, so answering to the first question i would actually end up with a question that the issues that are faced by adolescent girls are unique and we must be at the tables to negotiate them and discuss the issues so why are others also taking decisions on behalf of us to encourage their participation in the csw adolescent girls must be given seats in every discussion that is being taking place and it is not just adolescent girls being given space but their voices are to be equally respected heard and also considered while making decisions otherwise it is just tokenism um 
it must also be made sure that adolescent girls from marginalized communities who are at the forefront of these risks are also given accessibility to these spaces. The discussion often ends with the fact that um, Global South is vulnerable to climate change, which is very, very true. But the discussion needs to penetrate into the fact that adolescent girls, women and young people, again, from these Global South communities, there are also marginalized communities within them. And they are the ones who are facing the risk of climate change before us. So they need to be at the discussion tables, making decisions for themselves. Um, so along with that, there needs to be safe spaces, even within the CSW, when, where adolescent girls can actually discuss freely with each other the issues they are facing. And it should be documented. And this documentation should be again discussed by adolescent girls with the stakeholders. Also, the youth task force and Adolescent Girls Committee, which is coming up, they should be given more spaces in the CSW so that we can put our voices forward and demand for change. Also, there are many adolescent and youth mobilizations that take place, such as the Global Climate Strikes by Fridays for Future. So these Global Climate Strikes and uh, different types of demands which take place around the world, we, have, uh, we create discussions and demands at the grassroots level at particular region. So these also need to be taken seriously by stakeholders and governments because they are specific to the a particular region. Um, to, so to conclude, I will really say that adolescent girls are not voiceless, nor they're powerless. It is just that you have to give us the space at the discussion tables, hear us out, respect us, because we are very clear with our demands and definitely we are mobilizing for change. Thank you so much, Andrila, for sharing that. And, you know, this idea of moving beyond tokenism and, and what it looks like to have adolescent girls and their voices heard, respected, create the creation of that safe space and opening space for their, their contributions, I think is, is wonderful and more, we, more needed in terms of um, the commission and what that looks like moving forward. So thank you so much. So we'll turn now to our final speaker. Um, I would like to introduce Huri Gudlekian, who is the chair of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women. Um, to give us, uh, bring us to a close here and, and give us a, a few updates on what is happening next week and opportunities to engage. Well, Safira, I want to first thank you. What an amazing session that you led. And I, I have so much to say, but we're already late. We're, we have run over time and there's so many meetings to go to. I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. I want to first thank Mariella and Maris for staying through and listening, the plan was not to end with adolescent, but I'm so happy it worked out that way because you could hear yourself. Now you're energized to bring her voice into the negotiation room, right? I mean, who speaks so eloquently and so truthfully? And, and you know, we marginalize, and, and the, the fact that she actually highlighted, it's not just adolescent girls, it's the marginalized communities within that as well. I'm so grateful for you, thank you for, you know, just ending our amazing session with that message. I also am very excited to hear from Maris that there is hope. We have to live with hope, right? We, I mean, I'm, I, I, we are really proud of what we've done together this year with Youth Voices, Adolescent, Member States, thanks to Maris and the Bureau, the Complete Bureau, plus Costa Rica and Denmark has been such an amazing support for us. I wanna keep thanking them because I want the other member states to step up and say, oh, we can do this too, right? <laughs> so we are very happy for where we are right now, but of course there's still another week of negotiations. And we know from history, it's the second week that really is you know, scary. Like we wanna make sure that everything we've gained, we keep in the document. But let's celebrate what Methods of Work has done already, thanks to Maris. Let's celebrate that Youth Voices finally did make it in. And it might not be as strong as we want, but every little gain counts. So thank you for that. And I just want to highlight this whole community of youth and adolescent girls. I am so inspired 
I mean, it's not, it hasn't been an easy week because we're all busy and we're doing so many different events and we do one step back and one step uh, forward. But this is truly the highlight of CSW for me. And I'm so grateful. And I want to like, there, I want to end by saying, I know at NGO CSW, we keep talking about collaborative, transparent, shared leadership model. Cool. Yeah. For us older people, <laughs> we definitely milked that and used it to our benefit. But something else is emerging for me today because of adolescent. I think the way forward for the global feminist movement that includes all marginalized voices, I think we need to bring love, respect, and action. And that's what I felt today. I felt the love and the respect between the different communities and the intelligence that youth brought to the table. So now, and, and also the action, like everybody's taking action. So let's switch from what we've been saying with the more seasoned, I, I shouldn't use the word older, right? <laughs> um, activists. And now let's talk about how we are bringing together the love of this earth and each other, the respect we have, and then let's take action. And thank you so much. I'll see you at the next Zoom meeting. Thank you so much, Huri. And thank you all to our speakers and to everyone who joined us on the call today. So many resources have been shared. So many connections have been made in the chat. So we, can, we encourage you to continue to do so and wish you all a wonderful remainder of the commission and looking forward to moving beyond the CSW and working together towards COP27. So thank you all so much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye, thank you, everyone. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.